But over a period of time, the, the pyramids became smaller and more reliance was utilized for, um, and what we would just call, an, mm, can't call it an ordinary tomb, but a tomb. And these are largely built for the nobles beginning around the fourth and fifth dynastic periods about 4,500 years ago. Here I am in one of those tombs in a place called Saqqara and in another one. What is interesting here is how bright and vivid the colors remain after 4,500 years. And so a part of that scientific innovation would have been the brilliant colors or how you would preserve um, the colors, the paint you would use, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not a scientist. I'm a historian and I'm just walking you through memory lane so we can have a better appreciation, I would hope, for what our ancestors contributed to the world before, during and after enslavement. Now we've jumped a thousand years and we are in a place called um, Luxor. And these are the kings and, um, and monarchs who built there. This is Tudmos the first and his daughter Hapshetsut. Hapshetsut is the um, daughter of a king, she marries a king, and she herself becomes a king. That's right, a female king of Kemet, and in all likelihood, she was not the only one. And she is a great builder. This is her temple at a place called Dur el Bari. But even more than that, she is responsible for these monuments we call Tekken or Obelisks. And it's ironic that a woman had the largest ones erected because they are, as you can see, phallic symbols. Phallic symbols, but they were also a kind of a clock. You could tell what time of day it was by the shadow caused by the reflection of the sun. And they were victory monuments. You would put the great deeds of the monarch, inscribe them in the glyphs in the metal net, in the metal netter, uh, or metal netter on these obelisks. These are in Karnak and these were built during the reign of Hapshetz, one for her and one for her father. And apparently she was gonna do some more, but this one, which would have been the biggest of them all, a thousand tons, still in the quarry, developed a little crack as they were excavating it. And these Africans wanted perfection. And so since it developed a hairline fracture, it was abandoned. These sisters and brothers did not settle for second best, good enough, it's okay, mediocrity, see gray, they wanted excellence. They thought that they were glorifying God and the God in us. And so this is the unfinished obelisk in the quarry of um, Aswan. And this is the brother who hooked it up. This is Cinema. He's a great engineer. He's, many people believe, the significant other of Hapshetzit. He's holding Hapshetzit's daughter. And he's the engineering genius who is responsible for much of the work during this time. We don't always know the names of the individuals who actually engineered these pro, um, projects. Imhotep and Cinnamon are two. And this is during the time of Tutmos III. And you can see how, uh, and my brother Anthony Browder is superb at this, you can see how the Nile Valley has influenced America, the United States. Uh, my brother Tony does a tour called Egypt on the Potomac. You ought to check it out. Now, here's an image, a statue, or here's an obelisk, the Washington Monument. And some say this was done by Benjamin Banneker and the reflection pool. And it seems to be <laughs> a duplicate of what you see at Karnak Temple in Luxor, Egypt. You know that the so-called founding fathers, many of them slave owners, were also in large measure Rosicrucians and Masons and what have you. And they were influenced by ancient Egypt. They may not have acknowledged that the ancient Egyptians were African, were black folk, but certainly they saw the importance of Egypt in history. This is uh, the Colossi of Memnon. And this is important, this is here because one of them every morning there 60 feet tall was known to make a singing or whistling sound with the rising of the sun. That takes engineering skill. Nobody even knows how they did it, even now. This is Queen Tai. This is the wife of Amenhotep III. That's who those statues belong to. They are the parents of Akhenaten, the parents-in-law of Nefertiti, and the grandparents of Tutankhamun. Look at this stern-looking African woman, and you have to ask yourself, how did they preserve a piece? This is made of wood in large measure. You would. 
So how would they preserve that? This is 3,400 years old. It looks lifelike, these Africans. And the brilliant colors in the tomb. This is Tutankhamun's tomb. The metallurgy, the metallurgical skills that went into uh, the production of this mask, which is made of gold and painted in these brilliant colors. How did they get it to last for so long? And there's Tutankhamun himself. And this is from his tomb. Once again, the colors, that's a whole nother subject. This is one of my favorites. This is Sheshat. Sheshat is a female aspect of God married to Jehuti. And she is referred to as the mistress of the house of books. She was a kind of a, an accountant and a mathematician. And her title was the mistress of the house of books. She's the world's first librarian, my kind of sister. And this is a beautiful piece of Ramses the Great right here, Ramses II, who reigned 60 some years and who was responsible for a temple complex at a place called Abu Simbel. This, there are two temples here. There's a temple of Ramses the Great himself. And then next to it is the temple of Ramses the Great and his significant other, Nefertari. I always say, what good is a king without a queen? Now look at the two of the statues here. And then here's all four of them. And I am convinced that that is a prototype from Mount Rushmore. So on the one hand, you have four African kings or four, four kings in Africa because they're all Ramses the Great. They're 60 feet high. And this temple was relocated. Um, the, um, the Aswan Dam was being constructed. The waters were expanding. And so this was moved from the original site to another. Now, one of the interesting things about this, and I'll get to it in a minute, is that it's perfectly illuminated with natural sunlight twice a year. That's engineering skills. One of the things you never see in the tombs or in the temples are smudges from torches. So how did they even light up the tombs so they could see enough to do their work? That's another thing. But anyway, I'm convinced this is where the inspiration of Mount Rushmore comes from. Four presidents and four kings of Kemet. Give me the kings of Kemet. And all the way in the interior, on the king's birthday and one other day of the year, the inner sanctuary was called the Holy of Holies would be illuminated with natural sunlight. Here's another one. And this is a sister friend of mine, a wonderful sister named Felicia Harden. She's one of my staunchest supporters. She's one of the founders of a group called Happy Talks and the Happy Movement with a brother named Taki Grant. And here she is inside the temple not long ago, holding an ankh, the key of life. Good sister, good sister. Now let's begin to wind down and try to get to the United States because I can see I'm long-winded tonight. Here's Ramses the Great painted black. Here's an interesting piece. This is from a temple at a place called Abydos. And Abydos was built by Ramses the Great, Ramses the Second, and his daddy Seti the First. And look at these um, glyphs here. This looks like a helicopter, looks like a submarine, and I don't know what this is. I don't know what they are. I'm not claiming that the Egyptians had helicopters and submarines, but they look like that. It's at the entrance and inside another one of the tombs of Ramses the Third. These are canopic jars found by the Aza Restoration Pro product, uh, Project, which consists of a number of sisters and brothers, including Anthony Browder, Atlantis Browder, my brother Darren McKnight. These are canopic jars. When they mummified the bodies, they had to embalm them and they removed the internal organs of the deceased. They put the heart, the liver, and the intestines in these four jars that represented the four cardinal directions of the earth. So they knew something about medical science and this reflects that too. This is at a temple called Kanambo. And here you have actual medical instruments, including a stethoscope. Here's these, this is a woman seated, seated on a birthing stool. Kanambo is a medical temple and you can see there the baby coming out, I guess being drawn out by gravity. Metallurgy, this is gold, this is from Nubia. Nubia was called the land of gold. Kemet was not the only great kingdom in the Nile Valley. You have several. 
and this uh, another one is Imhotep. He's in here again because towards the end of the dynasties, he's elevated again to the status of a deity 2,000 years after his death. His mama again. Here is an interesting piece as we begin to leave Kemet. Here's what some people believe is a model glider that was found in Saqqara, Egypt. It's 300 BC. It's made of balsa wood. And it was in the museum in Cairo during the Arab Spring when it mysteriously disappeared. It hasn't been seen yet. A team from NASA actually went to Egypt and did studies on it and said it flies like a B-52. So long before the Wright brothers were a twinkle in anybody's eye. These are Anubia. These are in Sudan. And pyramid building was revived there. Here are just some of the pyramids. To Ethiopia, just to show that civilization was not confined to the Nile Valley. And this is from a place called Aksum. Over here, not far, is where the Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be. And these are obelisks different from those in Kemet, but still it would have taken some real skill to carve these and stand them up. How did you do that? This is 2,000 years ago. And here are some that have fallen over, broken on the ground. Also in this area is a place called um, the Palace of the Queen of Sheba. We're in the Horn of Africa now. And this is called Sheba's Bath, the famous Queen of Sheba. All this takes engineering skills. They carved, the Ethiopians carved the church out of the living earth. This is Betta George. This is where his imperial majesty, Haile Selassie was coronated king, uh, emperor of Ethiopia. Local people say this wasn't built by folk at all. This was built by angels. In great Zimbabwe in Southern Africa, a series of stone cities in Mali lived the people called the Dogon. The Dogon are African stargazers. They live in the mountains and they know about the orbital patterns of uh, Saturn. Most, more importantly, they know about Sirius B, a star that has imploded upon itself, a white dwarf and its orbital patterns. And they have a 700 year knowledge of it. Western astronomers only became, um, they noticed it, I think in the late 19th century and only photographed it, I think in 1970. Our brother Hunter Adams is a, expert on that. These are the Dogon. A Dogon door, wood carving. With the Niger manuscripts, like the Timbuktu manuscripts, they speak of African scientific achievement hundreds of years ago. In Europe, we find this example of Andromeda. Andromeda, according to the Greeks, was an Ethiopian princess who married Perseus. The Andromeda Galaxy is named after her. The Andromeda Galaxy is named after a black woman. And then slavery. Muda Baruka says slavery, it's not African history. Slavery interrupted African history. One of the most tragic aspects of it, and there were many, is that it made a lot of us forget we had a history before enslavement. And so it's my job and the job of my peers and colleagues and brothers and sisters in the movement to make us remember what we forgot. This is just a diagram of us packed away on one of those floating coffins called slave ships and sitting at the door of no return. To imagine the thoughts that, if you haven't done this, the thoughts that run through your mind as an African in the diaspora who comes back home and sits in front of the door of no return. This is where the Africans were taken out. Wasn't going to see Africa anymore after that. And so to be able to come back to Africa, to go back to Africa and sit and reflect about the experience of our ancestors and our indebtedness to them is a very, very powerful emotional experience. And we were taken from places like Gory Island, where you actually had a dungeon for children, an infant's dungeon, and from Fort James in the Gambia, and from Elmina and Cape Coast in Ghana, and the Wood House in Togo. And in spite of that, Africans continue with their scientific achievement because they brought Africa with them. We were taken from Africa, but we took Africa with us. And so let us finish with the second part 
of our presentation. We talked about Ivan Van Sertema, my great mentor, and we know that Ivan is famous in particular. Let me just hydrate here for a moment. It's famous for the book that came before Columbus. He also did tremendous work on Kemet, Egypt, and the Moors. The book, The Golden Age of the Moor, is the best so far. But one of his most important works is called Blacks in Science. And here is the book. And I wanted to read, and I don't often get a chance to read when I'm doing these presentations. But I wanted to read as we wind down a passage from the book. He says, few Americans are aware of the major contribution of Blacks to modern technology. Listen to this. In 1913 alone, as many as 1,000 inventions were patented by African Americans. And those were the fortunate few who got as far as the patent office. In the 19th century, several slaves invented labor-saving devices or were not allowed to patent them in their own names. In 1858, the Attorney General of the United States ruled that since a patent was a contract between the government and the inventor, and since a slave was not considered a United States citizen, he could not make a contract with the government. In spite of these oppressive and inhospitable circumstances, there was no total loss of black ingenuity and technological innovation. The thread of African genius began to unravel like light speeding through spools of the glass fiber, like guides, black scientists nor it overdeveloped or the impulses traveling along the transatlantic cable Richardson helped to lay down, channeling voices from one continent to another, from one time to another, bridging the chasm between the ancestral African and the modern black, between root and branch, seed and flower, an old heart and a new brain. That's the essence of blacks and science. Let's follow that path. Now in the United States, just like I mentioned uh, about Sheikh Anta Jop, you have scholars who also were, and Dr. Finch and Dr. Gallman, you have scholars who were also scientists. Physicians. Now, this is one of my favorites. This is Martin Robeson Delaney. And Dr. Delaney, uh, we call him Dr. Delaney, is one of the first group of Black folk to attend Harvard University. Of course, he couldn't stay, the Harvard University Medical School. Those white folks kicked him out with two other brothers after a few weeks. But he was trained at a as a medical assistant. And as a result of that, he was, helped, he was able to help stop the spread of a cholera epidemic in Pittsburgh in the 1850s. And then here's a book that uh, one of our brothers, Jose Miguel, turned me on to on a recent um, interview with World Beat. And this book is called The Black Doctors of Colonial Lima. For whatever reason, because we don't want to just focus just on the United States, we're not tribal. For whatever reason, only Black people, only Africans were physicians in the colonial period of Peru. Let me read one paragraph from the back of the book. The Black Doctors of Lima focuses on the lives and fortunes of three of the most distinguished among this group of Black physicians. Jose Pastor de Laranaga, a surgeon of controversial medical ideas who passionately defended the rights of scientific le learning for Afro-Peruvians. Jose Manuel de Valos, a doctor who studied medicine at the University of Montpelier and played a key role in the smallpox vaccination campaigns in Peru. And Jose Manuel Valdez, a multifaceted writer who became the first and only person of black ancestry to become a chief medical officer in Spanish America. And we never heard of any of those brothers. Most of our history hasn't even been written yet. Why? Because we haven't written it. Now in Suriname, the only Dutch colony in South America, I was told about a brother who also born in Africa, who helped prevent a smallpox epidemic because these Africans took their skills with them. They weren't 
slaves who were taken from Africa. They were humans and they had occupations and some of them were scientists. These are in Paramaribo, Suriname. And finally, Babylon, USA. And let us end by paying tribute to some of the most significant of these African-American scientists and, inventors and, and um, inventors like Benjamin Banneker who lived from 1731 to 1806. He was an astronomer and mathematician. He wrote an almanac, an almanac, maybe it's more accurate to say he compiled an almanac. He had a lot to do with the layout of Washington, DC. Some say he's a member of the Dogon community. We've already talked about the Dogon stargazers, Benjamin Banneker, Ashe. And we can talk about uh, George Augustus Morgan, who, was, uh, who developed a precursor to the gas mask. And he was also an activist, a community activist, Garrett Augustus Morgan. And we pay homage to Elijah McCoy, the real McCoy, born in 1856, died in 1910. He patented 57 inventions. And here's a sister <laughs> I had never heard of until today. Her name is Alice Ball. She was born in 1892 and she died in 1916. She was only 24. She was a chemist. And she's the first person to develop a treatment for leprosy. Did you know an African-American scientist named Alice Ball did that? And she was only 24 when she passed away. Granville T. Woods had a lot to do with the telephone and the streetcar. Born in 1856, died in 1910. And then Louis Latimer, I call him Louis Latimer, bringer of light, one of the most preeminent African-American scientists. And then Ernest Everett Just, a biologist called the Black Apollo of Science. He worked at an HBCU, Howard, a marine biologist. Ernest Everett Just, the Black Apollo. And then Charles Drew. Now I live in Los Angeles, I've lectured at Charles Drew University of Medicine. It's in the hood. This brother worked with blood banks. He saved the life, his research saved the lives of countless American soldiers in World War II. His research was blood plasma, the preservation of blood, blood banks, Charles R. Drew. And perhaps the greatest of them all, maybe the most illustrious of them all, the great George Washington, Carver, who taught at Tuskegee University, I believe during the time of Booker T. And Marcus Garvey came to the United States to meet Booker T. Washington. You see how all of this is interconnected, how all of this is, is bound together. And Marcus Garvey, of course, said, I didn't just put him up here for nothing. Garvey said, we must develop African people, a race of scientists second to none. Marcus Mosiah Garvey, who said, we are going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery because whilst others might free the body, none but ourselves can free the mind. And remember, our history didn't begin in chains and it's not gonna end there. Check this out. Don't believe what I post, sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, research it for yourself. Don't believe what I post, research it for yourself. And just a nice image of an African scientist, a young brother, and Dr. May Carol Jemison. I love this sister. She was the first African-American woman astronaut in space. And maybe I'm not supposed to say it these days, but she was fine. Beautiful, brilliant black woman. What more could you ask for? And here I am on one of my trips to Kemet 10 years ago with Dr. Uh, Abdullahim Shabazz, who told me he trained 75% of all the African-American PhD candidates in mathematics. It was an honor for him to be on my tour. And then I <laughs> pulled this one out. I think her name was Shura in the film Black Panther. One of the wonderful things about that film is it showed what Africa might have been like if, if it hadn't been disrupted by enslavement, colonization, and invasion. They never used the N word, they never used the B word. Black women with natural hair. The conflict between those of us in the diaspora and those of us on the continent, brothers gonna work it out. But you had a young sister who was a scientist 
And I love that. Imagery is so powerful, Leonard Jeffries would say. And then, of course, a lot of our interest in African-Americans and science and technology and mathematics and engineering was uh, um, amped up through the film Hidden Figures about sisters Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson and Katherine Johnson. And there are, I would imagine, many hidden figures people that we have never heard of because most of our story has not been told yet. And so what I say is we end it, our ancestors paid a tremendous price for us to be able to speak out against injustice and we don't have the right to be silent. And if you want some more, and I hope you do, especially about the Nile Valley, I encourage you to check out my webinars at the end of the month. This month, the end of Black History Month 2021 on February 26th, and February 22nd, we're gonna to return to the Nile Valley. We're gonna look at the expulsion of the Hiscos, the first national liberation struggle on the continent. We're gonna look at the glorious 18th dynasty with Hapshetsut and the Tutmosids and the Amenhoteps and Queen Tai and Akhenaten and Nefertiti and Tutankhamun. And then we're gonna look at the great Ramesside dynasty, dynasty 19. But I think for tonight, we have covered a whole lot and I've enjoyed every second of it. So, Empress Makeda, it's on you. Hey, I mean, it's beautiful. It was, I just loved how you put every, merged everything in. Uh, our history, because it really, you know, African-American history or our story is way back. I mean, in ancient Egypt, they just found out, I saw uh, that they found 5,000 year old uh, brewery. And you know, we made beer and all the liquor, agriculture, and just a story that has a, a whole brewery. I wonder how, I wonder how that, uh, I wonder how that beer tastes. The, the, the Camites drank a lot of beer. They drank a lot of wine. They ate a lot of bread. They were very, very human. If we were to be able to go back in time, I think we would be able to fit into Kemet quite easily because that's us. Mm -hmm. oh, we would have had a great time. The Dogun, they, they say they have some nice beer too. So the Dogun tribe has taken that, that uh, our ancient Kemetic secrets and put them in the mountains of Mali, you know? Well, look, they feel we're from the star Sirius. I feel I'm on, I'm from that star. <laughs> Let me say this. So I'm, done. I'm done because I talked a little longer than I had planned to, but it was good. I've talked about my brother, Tony Browder, quite a bit. Happy talks because it does take a village. It does take a community. World be. Well, one of the things that Browder does is he talks about, and Shigan Job does the same thing that Africans moved out of the Nile Valley as the Nile Valley was invaded and went to other parts of Africa. And some of us moved into West Africa or we were caught up in the Maafa and ended up in the so-called transatlantic slave trade. So you could say that that Kemite, that happy, that Nile Valley DNA runs through us. And so there is a natural connection there and we need to build on that. Empress McKenna, I think what you are doing with World Beat Center is wonderful. You've assembled a magnificent team. I love you and I appreciate you. And I'm glad that I was able to make a small contribution to you and World Beat during Black History Month. Thank you. Well, I, I, I loved how you, you merged it together because, you know, our history has been stolen, you know, and it was really something to see you in the museums. And what did you call that? Loot, loot, they loot. repositories of loot, you know. So I say, Mercury retrograde be damned. African people have surmounted every challenge, and we're gonna do this. We did it, huh? Yeah, we did. And, you know, thank we, you, my you know, sister. All the things. Well, let me. I got, I got a surprise for you. Uh, can we, can we uh, see those some brothers, and uh, they, Chico Freeman, and what's Avery? Avery Sharpe. Uh, Avery Sharp. <laughs> no Sharpe. <laughs> Avery Sharp and uh, Jamie. Uh, 
the satellite they and and my plants so this is really a surprise to you it is it's dedicated to you uh and uh dr george washington carver and you know he talked to his plants and we have a science um project with the national science foundation and we we world Beat center we pick plant intelligence and uh plants and trees communicate and so we're doing a whole thing you know stevie wonder he did the secret life of plants yeah. and so he whole album but people weren't ready at that time and when i say that we're researching plants that play music people are like okay even scientists and this is science so i'm gonna see you got to hear these brothers but thank you i know you you're listening chico in switzerland and avery so we're gonna put this on and my plants don't forget to hear uh this is a moringa tree playing with these brothers
So here we go. I, I hope so. Everybody heard that? Everybody heard it. Okay, cool. <laughs> oh, they're talking about the 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 uh, plant whispers. Oh wow, I got to do that. Mercury retrograde. I should know not to do anything in a retrograde. You know. So um, that's cool. Plant whispers. Plant whispers, and that was by Apri Sharp. Written, I'll do it again. <laughs> Written by Avery Sharp, and uh, he wrote it for Do Dr. George Washington Carver. And uh, man, it, uh, Jamie Shadlight, which is great violinist, Chico Freeman, and this brother played with McCoy Tyner, and so did Avery Sharp. You know, I'm I'm sorry if I'm going through this so fast, you brothers. You know, but we're gonna bring this back when we bring the other plants in. We're going to have a plant concert, you know, so you guys get ready for that as soon as we can gather uh, here at the World Beat Center and you can hear some of our plants playing. It's really incredible because of the way that plants can play through a synthesizer and play music. And the more you learn about plant intelligence and music, they loved it. You know, one Jamie was playing with uh, one of our Buddha trees. Uh, it's the tree that Buddha sat on and uh, sat under and got enlightened. Uh, so we have the only one in San Diego. It's an Unubara tree and uh, it's an incredible, incredible uh, tree with healing properties too. And so Jamie was playing with uh, her violin and oh, the tree was just loving it. And so that was a moringa tree that you heard with these jazz musicians, famous jazz music. I, I can't say enough of good things about, you know, these guys. They played with uh, McCoy Tyner, you know. So Chico Freeman, thank you so much. And Avery, thanks for, for writing this to George Washington Carver, a great scientist. And we had a lot of great scientists and we're gonna continue to talk about it. We have Chinzira. And she's going to talk about some of the things. She's going to be talking later on in March about women in science uh, in America and maybe abroad because she's in the Virgin Islands right now, one of my favorite places, because one of my great bands that I produce is from the Virgin Islands, uh, Akabeka and Midnight. So big up Desiree and Ronnie and uh, Master P, all of you brothers, batch, everybody in the Virgin Islands right now. Tenzer. Uh, greetings, greetings. Hey. I am, I'm undoing the 
technology that's happening for sure in retrograde. So it's not really giving me, here we go, an opportunity to change certain settings. Crazy. Oh, huh? there we go. Okay. Greetings, everyone. Always an honor and a privilege to join you, Sister Queen. Makeda, this is a wonderful segue into the International Women's Month here in the Virgin Islands. March is also Virgin Islands History Month. So I'm definitely looking forward to speaking of women as well as Virgin Island women and throughout the wider Caribbean persons that have contributed to the sciences, not only within NASA, however, in a wider space of doing research and engaging in developing technology. So I'm looking forward to that and wish to extend a very warm greeting to your listening and viewing audience. I would like to also take an opportunity, it's been a moment since I've had the honor and privilege to share space with the illustrious, ever so eloquent, beyond historian, Professor Renoko Rashidi. So I give thanks for being able to hear. That was a, that's a difficult piece to follow. So you just have to like, <laughs> you like call in after. And I'm like, but what? He gonna, he gonna shut it down. But yeah, he did. He, he, we give thanks. He's incredible. He's, he's, he's a crazy genius. Absolutely. Yeah. He is, and, and so are you. I'm giving so thanks for that. I give thanks for that. You know, you're working on movies, working on movie now, you're doing some things. What's happening in the Virgin Islands? You know, uh, you know, do you have a World Beat Center or things <laughs> that go on? Well, we, we have a, a small version of a World Beat Center, I'll say in development, yeah? It's currently a number of different organizations in the Virgin Islands. And I wish to highlight St. Croix as a cultural capital, St. Thomas that brings forth that shipping trade industry, that driving kind of vibration as well. And St. John providing that what people refer to as Love City, in addition to that, really bringing in that foundational spirit that goes far, far back into the 1730s where our African ancestors stepped forward and even in the midst of enslavement, were able to keep hold of an independent African space in regards to black nation nationhood from November 23rd, 1733 through May 24th, 1734. So we are working to tell these different narratives through, as, as I said earlier, in speaking with you, we've done this through the work of Queens of the Virgins, a ethno documentary that actually tells the narrative of African women that led various revolutionary to some rebellions, to others insurrections, to others labor uprisings, and to others nonviolent protests on St. John in 1733, in St. Croix in 1878, and in St. Thomas in 1892. And so that particular film is part of what we'd like to be highlighting and celebrating. We've had the honor and privilege of screening it in Carafesta and Barbados in 2017. And it's shifted because as we get new information that's more accurate of the origins of these women and the intentions and the revolutionary fervor of how these women organized. It wasn't just like happenstance and they just had a riot. It was actually planned and strategically engaged. And also it allowed for us to look at the different technologies that these women and others alongside men were able to develop and establish so that they were able to really endure as well as establish a certain form of resilience. Again, 1700s, 1800s, and then we bring that forward in terms of what is, you know, transpired. So I'm looking forward to being able to share some of that and also share some of the contemporary scientists that have been celebrated here. You know, there, there's so many that I'm 
I'm putting it together so that it will be more visual so we can know who some of these sisters are and to actually, you know, highlight some of their work. We're going to go as far south. There's a sister that I'm really interested in highlighting that's currently, you know, as we speak, you know, with background in mechanical aerospace engineering and things of that sort that actually is working with NASA. And that's Dr. Camille Aline. Aline. And she's at, originally from Trinidad and Tobago. So when we get that opportunity to have that versation, we're going to spend some time talking about some of her work and bringing it forward. So it's, I'm looking for it. <laughs> I, it's, um, I think my nephew was doing something on, uh, you know, um, astronomy, and uh, mm -hmm. and I, she might have been one of the, that he was talking about, and this other astronomer too that mm -hmm. uh, was in. Uh, South Africa, you know, it's really something that we don't have more Africans, Americans and African in science. Mm. You know, I mean, it's, it's, I'm really happy that we will be centered, could, you know, be forwarding in science with the National Science Foundation mm. to, you know, with STEM. And mm. we want to get more youth involved in science because we feel that science is not for us we've been left out so this project that we're have, you know working with Cornell University uh it's three years uh we're about eight months to go on this project but we picked um our science project was plants and it's uh it's about noise pollution and uh going into a noise sanctuary of, of from noise and coming in and healing yourself getting reiki um making an acknowledgement with the land spirits and you know because this is kumiai country so mm -hmm. i want to give thanks to the kumiai indians for that for mm -hmm. being here and uh they brought so much i mean here we are you know on on this sacred land so it's really going to be great, you know, Chinzira, to really hear your perspective and bring the knowledge of women in science. So how's it going? One thing I want to know, when did America acquire the Virgin Islands and St. Thomas? And how did that happen? Well, that's probably going to take us into a a, a trajectory that would take more time. So the brief response is that the actual transfer and purchase for $25 million in gold, and I like to highlight that because there's always a question of where did the United States acquire $25 million in gold after World War I to be able to do that in August, 1916 and then have a ceremonial transfer, you know, the military, you know, raising of the, you know, lowering of the Danish flag, raising of the U.S. flag on March 31st, 1917. So that's the, that period. And it lends itself to a significant place where conversations and actions and uprisings, even around self-determination, around decolonization are still prevalent. They were prevalent in the early 1900s and they've continued even after a hundred years of being under the sovereign rule of the United States. And so some persons are very comfortable with it being seen as you know, a territory of the United States of America and the legal name being the Virgin Islands of the United States. However, mm -hmm. to make it more touristy and more inviting, persons tend to always, and not, not just persons outside, even inside of the Virgin Islands, US, to look at it as United States or US Virgin Islands or America's paradise. So there's a, there's a significant conversation and this is something that's happening like as we speak, that there is a, a, a resurgence for this self-determination, this invisibility, this engagement yet not being engaged type of, you know, conversation. You know, we've seen it with what has transpired very recently, you know, while our very, and 
very engaged, very astute, and quite stunning in her delivery, our delegate to Congress was able to be selected for certain committees as a congresswoman. However, she is not permitted to vote because we are still a territory. So those questions about the transfer and the purchase, and it's really important to look, it wasn't just a transfer and purchase of land and resource. It was a transfer and purchase of people and Ooh. their and their and their legacy. So a lot of this is being revisited as we speak. You know, there's still a revised organic act that serves as the quote unquote constitution for the Virgin Islands of the US. And that has that has also been an area of, of dissension for some and acceptance to others, yeah. Um, when there was the centennial in 2017, there were some persons that actually celebrated the transfer and purchase from one, col you know, one colonial force to another. And there were others that said, it's not a celebration, it's a historical occurrence, but it's not a time to celebrate because of that same question around self-determination. But I wanted to come back to something you said earlier Puerto as well. Rico. Okay, Pardon? hold that thought. Puerto Rico yes. is in that too, right? Well, Same Puerto Rico is a Puerto Rico has a, a slightly different. Uh, they can't vote. True. However, they're a commonwealth. So that wow. operates a little differently in terms of political structure and their certain autonomy. They have a constitution. The Virgin Islands does not. And there have been five attempts for constitutional you know, reform and conventions, and they were all unsuccessful. Jeez. So right. I interrupted you what were you that's going to okay say? no but i wanted to come back i desired to come back to what you were talking about with stem so inside of the university of the virgin islands there are several programs that run quite parallel to the and you know with nsf funding that you referenced so that whole stem leadership and research piece you know through these various grants the university of the virgin islands established a center for the advancement of stem leadership castle and in that program, it is not only bringing together the different broadening opportunities for research to encourage minorities in the STEM fields, and it allowed for us to establish a collaboration with the, not only the University of the Virgin Islands, but with North Carolina A&T State University, Fielding Graduate University, and the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And what this has done is really push the envelope forward so that there are more engaging programs that are using various creative and innovative approaches to increase the number of minorities that are in these STEM fields, you know, on, not only on the undergraduate level, but all th the way through the PhD level. And so that's something that runs quite parallel and has been part of our conversations outside of, you know, what we're sharing this evening. And some of the cultural heritage education and cultural resource development has been highlighted through the Virgin Islands Caribbean Cultural Center, where I get to sit as the director and provide different opportunities to bring this cultural resource into these different STEM fields so that we're actually expanding into STEAM so that it's the science, the technology, the engineering, the arts, as well as right. mathematics. So it allows for us to take that particular work to another layer. So we do this not only in the Virgin Islands, we have partners, we're looking forward to expanding our collaborations with World Beat Center, as well as other institutions in the US. You know, We currently have a working engagement with the Slave Rex Project in concert with the Smithsonian Institutions, National Museum of African American History and Culture, along with George Washington University, Diving with the Purpose, Ezekiel Museums in South Africa, Eduardo Mondlane University in Mozambique, the Sheikh Anta Diop University in Senegal. And of course, the National Park Service has allowed for us to engage through the Department of Interior. It's like a very wide net of partnerships and collaborations. You know, the Society of Black Archaeologists has been very, very, involved in streamlining and even as recent as the Clothilda finding in Alabama and more specifically Africatown that has expanded the 
trajectory of how we engage students to have these opportunities, whether it's through directed study, course research, internships, you know, graduate fellowships, postdoctoral research, et cetera. So we're excited about expanding some of these types of programs along with other programs that are highlighted. And we do this through a lens of getting students to not only be involved in the research, but also learn how to engage in marketing and communication media so that people can know what they're doing and be a part of this journey, because that's the whole idea that we're doing to have our students more engaged and be more creative and innovative in their work. Do you have an ornithology department there? Uh, Not for... in that form, no. However, well, however. <laughs> I just want to tell you that I would like to bring our birding program with Cornell University over there because there's going to be, uh, you know, we have something that's, uh, that could be for the Caribbean in birding. Okay. So, yeah, there, there, there could be a grant for us to bring over. That would be fun, huh? First it would be a you. lot of fun, and it probably would be more engaging with some, not only in the VI US, but also the VI UK. Because in the British Virgin Islands, they have, again, very similar yet unique flora and fauna. So we start to see the diversity expand as we go within the Caribbean. So there's some spaces where, you know, there's certain parts of the VI US that that would work very nicely. We've had some persons that have done some wonderful work. There used to be a bird sanctuary in LaGrange, in Estate LaGrange in the Frederickstead area in St. Croix. And that was like I would, many- I like to see it in St. Croix. And the thing about it is- uh... We know you're coming. We can tell you're ready to come. <laughs> we can tell. <laughs> you know, everybody, everybody's ready. You know, you tell, you know, tell uh, Master P, you know, your radio DJ that um, that I'm coming. He talks about me on the radio too. All the time. Uh, All the that's time. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. Almost every almost every broadcast, your <laughs> name will come up. And if it's not every broadcast, it's definitely like every other. Yes. <laughs> I can't wait. So we have to put an art art festival on with that. So of course, we want the steam because the arts are really important. So we'll talk about that. Dr. Chin, you know, uh, you're great. You know, I'm thinking away. I was, I was on a uh, retreat you, and I, I stuck out of the retreat because it was Black History Month. Don't, don't tell my teacher. Silence is golden. <laughs> I just need to make sure that it's, you know, like we were saying earlier, there are opportunities for us to take this particular layer of work. Like we're very interested in getting our African youth to take literally another look at the sciences and technology so that they're comfortable knowing that this is part of the of a very engaging legacy and to you know so having that historical reference and to be able to pull on the work of Professor Bruno Rashidi as shared this evening and in general Right, And I encourage persons that are listening and viewing to really take that invitation that he shared with us very seriously. Because, you know, for me, it's going back as far as one of my very illustrious professors, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, may he rest in peace and his work wow. be honored for eternity. In, you know, very humble beginnings at Rutgers University in, in New Jersey. And it allowed for me to be able to bring that Caribbean African perspective in a space with another Caribbean African scholar to be able to be engaged and to not feel as if our engagement was like some, ha you know, some happenstance. Like it just happened that you would be able to understand certain things around science and technology. And so it allowed for myself and several others in that particular cohort to go further and take our research and our opportunities for work in different parts of not only the Caribbean, Central America and South America, but also into yeah. Africa. We did some things in Europe, but our focus, and we did some things in the Pacific Isles. However, our focus has always been in this equatorial portion, this tropical space you know, between Central and South America, 
the Caribbean and Africa. So I'm looking forward to that conversation being expanded as well. Well, you know, we see our science is quite different, you know, mm. um, because we have the arts, you know, us as indigenous people, we use arts with our science and we even explain the Pleiades different. You know, I, I, we the star Sirius. We look at stellar, stellar of astronomy totally different. Mm -hmm. uh, the Navajos, uh, they mm -hmm. they have observatories. You know, this rock that put together. You know, it's, it's incredible. So, uh, and they could tell. You know, the ancient Egyptian, the Kemetic people. You know, when the flood, there was the flood when the star Sirius was aligned. They knew it was going to be time to, it was a flood time. They could tell by, uh, you know, the stars. We don't even look up at the skies anymore. So I'm really uh, honored that we can work together uh, with Cornell University and uh, put a birding program there on the island. You have a lot of birds. I mean, I had uh, Von Benjamin was, he, he made a sound of a bird, some bird that he said that was on your island in, in an interview. So um, I know he's going to be really happy that we'll put that program together. Of course, of course. Well, again, there are a number of scholars that we do have here, you know, most that have affiliations with the University of the Virgin Islands, most that also have affiliations with the University of the West Indies and other institutions in the region. You know, several of them have been, you know, trained and engaged in postdoctoral research in similar fields in the U.S. and they are here. So, and especially now with everything being virtual, many persons are taking that time to go into these natural spots. And we have some very powerful areas that provide not only the cultural heritage resource, but it also provides the healing spaces. And there's a expanded piece, even around the astronomy programs. We do have an astrophysics degree program at the University of the Virgin Islands. We do have the Edelman Observatory on our Orville Ken campus in St. Thomas. And so there's a number of programs. Of course, things have become very limited you know, to, to sustain the physical distancing and all of the other protocols that the pandemic has demanded. However, there's this research that's very rich, you know, so we're able to look at <clears throat> the astronomy. We're able to look at these natural spaces. We're able to look at the cultural heritage spaces and then with a tapestry that's very unique, weave them together and really provide that opportunity, not only for our students and our faculty, but of course, by design, you know, to the wider community. So I'm looking forward to us being able to have that type of discussion and to start implementing those types of programs. Because again, we're surrounded by water. So it allows for us to do things that are terrestrial as well as things that are more aquatic. So it's, it's, a, it's a good blend. We're looking forward. The, the aquatic stuff is great. You know, you know, start uh, doing things um, with uh, the different wells and and sonic stuff. You know, that's exactly. really important because we're taking that frequency. We're working with that frequency mm -hmm. with uh, someone with at Cornell on uh, the uh, Raven technology. I don't know if you heard of that but it measures frequencies in like in whales and, you know, we're using it with the plant and the plant music. But we're gonna talk about this. It's so, science is so incredible. Um, and to get it to our youth and let them know as uh, people of color, you, you could be scientists too. And it's geology, you know, just rocks, man. I would <laughs> love to, you know, just studying the rock, you know, we don't own those mines. One of my friends was in Ethiopia, which we're putting in a World Beat Center there. He's, he's putting that. I'm so glad he's back home, Yogi. Yes. And uh, he's, uh, he was seeing kids kick around, you know, these rocks. And then he found out there were opals. Mm -hmm. And he started doing opals. I mean, 
we don't own those mines in Zimbabwe or South Africa, you know, and, and uh, South Africa has liquid gold, some of their verdite, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. Got beautiful stuff. And it's so important that, you know, we, we are the geologists, and we are the anthropologists and, you know, study these different uh, culture anthropology. I loved it in school. So, okay. So I'm so happy that you, know, <laughs> that you are there, Dr. Chen. How long, I'm going to let you, you know, fly here, but I just want to know how long we've known each other. Mm, it goes back, let's see, pre, right around the Profit International. So it's been since the late, late 70s, early 80s. Ooh, long time. Exactly. It's that, and it's, it's great it's been that a we're going to be working. I didn't hear the last portion. You go first. <laughs> no, I no, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. I, I said it's going to be great working with oh, absolutely. you on these science projects. And uh, I love it. And I'll get some things to your school uh, for birding right now. Uh, mm-hmm. And so you can start you know, giving the children in any of the the communities a package on bird okay. bird watching. Okay. So we look I'll, forward I'll have, to that. Yeah, I'll have that over. How many packages would you like? It would be ideal if we could start with twenty to twenty five, and then we can expand because right. I I know that a lot of the youth here, we many of our schools are still not in physical spaces. So even getting to the families, we usually have certain gatherings that are quite limited here on St. Croix in particular. And I would like to make sure that we can do that, have it equitably distributed, you know, with families that are in the parochial school, the private school, the public school, as well as our homeschoolers. So that would be ideal. You know, we can start there. I, I thought about, we have a number of ecologists and botanists that are really involved in some of that same field of study. You know, I would be remiss if I did not mention one of our, you know, native sons who really has become the voice of all things ecological, all things grounded in nature, and that's Professor Olasi Davis, who's in the new school of agriculture that is used to be part of the, or I should say is still part of the Cooperative Extension Service. However, he has literally, you know, been involved in the St. Croix Hiking Association as one of the founders, and they've literally hiked virtually every island in the Caribbean and other spaces. So they, you know, there's many in that association that would be ideal to engage in this conversation. You know, there's- Right. And specifically around the burning. Correct. Because yes. that's what they know <laughs> and that's what they do and that's what they see. So, you know, we're, we're really excited about that as well. And we've had the joint privilege. We have a very rare uh, screeching owl that's usually in the north side of St. Croix. However, you have to be so quiet. You have to be extremely quiet and you almost have to like sit in serious silent meditation for them to even make their sound much less for you to see them you know but we have I can say I have (laughs) I can say I have and and it took it it took several hours and a few days each of those time you know like several hours over a course of days right you know to be able to be in the same space and be silent and engaged enough that we heard the sound and then without movement we were able to see, you know, the owl come forth. Not at that large, but a beautiful, beautiful. It was, I felt like it was a spiritual experience in addition to being, you know, just a, a culturally inviting experience. So I'm looking forward to what you have shared with us and definitely will bring others from the team, you know, at the University of the Virgin Islands, as well as our very wide communitarian organizations that would be able to be of assistance and support. They might, again, they have more information on that than I do. So I'm, I'm very humbled to be able to just be a liaise to be able to make that happen. Well, that's going to happen really soon because um, 
we talked about it with Cornell. And mm -hmm. so I chose the Virgin Islands. Oh, um, so I can't, I can't leave this conversation on scientists uh, without mentioning, you know, my mentor and that's Dr. Kwaku Ando from Ghana, mm -hmm. ethnobotanist. That's and right. He, he turned me on to Moringa and Tabanaka Iboga and Cat's Claw, which I saw in the jungles of Peru, mm -hmm. uh, the Amazon. And so I just, he's, he's passed, but I would never know what Moringa was about unless it was from you know, Dr. Kwaku and, uh, and he That's was right, right here planning uh, our Moringa in the World Beach Center Ethnobotany Garden. And it's mm. really dedicated to him and George Washington Carver. Mm. So great scientists and exactly. so are you. And, you know, Dr. Renoko Rashidi, uh, Dr. Chenzir, wow, we're honored to have such um, cosmic, mm. intelligent, uh, mm. grassroots intellectuals, you know, on uh, this World Beat Live show. Give thanks, and I can't wait to, and I know our audience can't wait to see you and talk to you and ask you questions uh, in uh, in March. We're, you know, they would give us the short, shortest months of the year. <laughs> But, but we make it work. Like See, but we make it work. The The advantage that we have is that they can give us, remember it started as Negro History Week. You know, Carter right. D. Woodson was just getting a week and then it expanded to the month and then the Black history and some persons take it to the African-American history or Black African history. And it's, you know, and we do this here on this side of the hemisphere and on the other side of the hemisphere the in the UK, they celebrate Black History Month in October. So, you know, Whoa. we get a chance. So if we look at this, and that's one of the longest months in the year. So, you know, we've got a 28 day in this hemisphere, we've got a 31 day. So if we blend that and recognize that every single day is Black History Month, every single day. So it's Black History 365, 24 seven, 366 on leap years, then we know that they can say 28 days all they want, but we know that the essence and the work that's being done is allowing us to really take heritage, education, ancestral legacies, <laughs> heritage, education, ancestral legacies to the highest heights. So we're always in that healing mode, always in that healing mode with Black history, because Black history is all the time. And Black history is world history. So, you know, and what you're doing, Sister Queen Makada, is amazing. You know, what World Beat Center has established, established as a form of excellence, like literally t raising the bar, creating a new bar of, of how we engage with the arts and the sciences that govern the universe. We're very grateful, very, very grateful to be a part Thank of that. You. Thank you, sister. And I'm grateful for you. You tell my St. Cory brothers and sisters that I want to be there. And uh, that even if I, whatever happens with the COVID thing, I'll make sure you you uh, have that grant Give to uh, to put on a uh, bird festival. Give thanks. We're looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a blessed Love evening. You. I love, love you. you as well. And, and I, again, I can't say how much, you know, how much I really appreciate you. What, you know, just an incredible, I got, I got animals that followed me in here. Grateful. <laughs> Grateful. You can tell all I need is the chickens and the goats, you know. <laughs> you know that's my come. country. That's my country I have. But I, I, I even have talking birds that try to tell me off. Okay. You know? I have parents. That means their vocabulary is expanding. This is oh, good. They, they've been with me for 50 years. Wow. So I have to will them to someone. They got to, you know, they got parents to live a long time. Mm -hmm. so if mm -hmm. you take care of them, these guys, are too, you know, they're, they're top notch. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So see you. Thank you. Thank Blessings you and peace. All right, Blessings. my sister. Good night.
Good night. Hotel.